All right, the Dutch Puritans. We're using, should be Puritans in quotation marks because the Dutch Puritans are actually called the Nadera Reformatie. I'll spell it for you. I don't have a chalkboard here. N A D, N A D E R E, and then Reformation only replace the O N on the end just with an E. Reformatie, T I E instead of T I O N. Now, the Dutch Reformation proper, which is the first part of the 16th century, followed four periods. A Lutheran period, 1517 to 1526. A so-called sacramentarian phrase, a lot of emphasis on the sacraments, 1526 to 1531. Then there was a short Anabaptist movement from 1531 to 1545, And around 1545 came in what's called the Calvinist infiltration. Uh, From the outset, the Calvinists came into the southern Netherlands around 1545 and penetrated the northern Netherlands around 1560. And the Calvinist movement kind of swallowed up all the others. And Dutch, the Dutch um, scene became very Calvinistic. And that led ultimately to various Calvinistic synods in the 1570s, 1580s, 1590s, spilled over into the 17th century. And then the first international reform synod was held, what's called the, the Great Synod of Dort, Short for Dordrecht, which is the city which the city was the synod was held in 1618, 1619. And it was at the Synod of Dort that the Dutch Further Reformation, the Dutch Further Reformation, I'm gonna argue that's the best translation of the words Nadra Reformatie. Um, was intensified, and it was primarily a 17th and 18th century movement, beginning with Willem Tielink and ending with Alexander Cymru and Theodorus van der Groot. Now, this movement was, generally speaking, 40 to 50 years later than English Puritanism, and it lasted 70 or so years longer. So the Dutch movement was really brought into being through the influence of English Puritanism, but it began to be shaped as an endemic movement in itself. So the best way to look at the Dutch so-called Puritans is that the Puritans, the English Puritans, had a greater influence on this movement in the Netherlands than anything else. And yet, there are unique elements about it that scholars don't actually, well, some scholars do, but most scholars today don't call it a Dutch Puritan movement because it has some of its own individual character to it. But older scholars like F. Ernest Steffler uh, called it the Dutch Puritans, just as he, you would call the Scottish Puritans, which Ian Hamilton is speaking on uh, right now. And yet, technically, Scottish movement also had its own unique features. So it's probably better called the Scottish Covenanters or, or the Scottish Second Reformation sometimes. So these are technicalities, but really... This address and Ian's address at the same time about the Dutch Puritans and the Scottish Puritans, outside of the language language barrier here with the Dutch, the the two movements are are very, very similar. Very similar. Um, The Dutch Further Reformation ministers, 
and their writers are very influential. They have written hundreds and hundreds of books. The only difficulty is, and I'll explain that later in more detail, is that the Dutch translated many hundreds, maybe a thousand or more Puritan books into Dutch. And we English people are so self-centered, I guess. We've only done a dozen, maybe 15 books from the Dutch into the English. The nice thing, of course, is when we translate a book from Dutch into English now, we translate it in contemporary language. So they're all very easy to read. And they're equal in substance, I would say, in terms of spiritual depth, uh, experiential theology, as the English Puritans. So what I want to do in this talk is I want to, first of all, give you a bit of a closer, more nuanced look at the term Nadra Reformatie. It's been translated several different ways, and I want to show you why I think Dutch Further Reformation, though not ideal, is still probably the best translation. But there's no exact translation for the word nadra. That's a, it's a hard word to translate. So that's first. A little bit more about that. Second, I'm going to try to define for you the essence of the Dutch Further Reformation movement. And then thirdly, I'm going to take a brief look at the lives and writings of those Dutch Further Reformation pastors who have at least one of their books translated into English. Okay? So first the, the term, then the essence, and then the books. The term. The term Narada, N-A-D-E-R-E, -E, literally means nearer, nearer, closer, or more intimate, or maybe even more precise. So more precise reformation, that sounds awkward. More intimate reformation, intimenter, and that, that's, that doesn't work. Um, nearer reformation, sounds awkward. But that's what the term indicates. Now, what names have been tried? Well, first of all, the name Further Reformation is good in the sense that what the Dutch divines are saying is the same thing the English Puritans were saying, is that all the Reformation doctrines are great. But how do we go further? and apply it to every area of our lives. So in that sense, the word further is good because it's not implying that the Reformation, the actual Reformation, didn't go far enough. All the truths, we embrace them all, the Dutch divine said. But now we have the luxury of spending time on applying it to different areas of our lives because we don't have to hammer out all these doctrines like justification by faith alone and purity of worship, because that's already been done for us by the hard work of the Reformers. Cornelius Grafland, who's a great secondary source scholar for the Dutch for the Reformation, suggests the terms continuing Reformation and Second Reformation. He says one of those two would be best. Well, the term continuing has a couple disadvantages because it doesn't distinguish this movement far enough from the Reformation. This is like continuing Reformation. Like there's nothing different between this movement and the last movement. And there is. And the second problem <coughs> is no one else is using this term continuing. So you'd have to try to break that into the scholarly world, and that's pretty tough to do. Second Reformation is a weak translation, because not of ours certainly does not mean second. And it's also confusing because the Scottish Reformation 
after the First Reformation is called the Scottish Second Reformation very often. So if you said Dutch Second Reformation, it would, it would confuse. Or people would think, oh, the Dutch and the Scottish are exactly alike. And they're not. And then there are two other names that have been suggested. One is Dutch Precisionism. Because Puritans, of course, wanted to live precise lives to the glory of God. The problem with precisionism is it's kind of a pejorative term and it suggests a kind of legalistic tone perhaps, but also it's not an accurate translation of the word nadara. The other possibility is of course that you use the term uh, Dutch pietism, pietism. Problem with that term is that pietism with a capital P usually refers to the German movement that grew another 50 years later out of English Puritanism and a couple other influences. And German pietism and the Dutch movement, though they're both concerned about piety of life, as is English Puritanism, they're actually a little bit further apart than English Puritanism and the Dutch movement. So if you call it pietism, you you think the Dutch and the German are very close together, and and they're not. The Dutch are more concerned about sound theology, the German pietism. German pietism is more designed to do acts of mercy, like um, establishing orphanages and practical hands-on Christian things, a little bit more than the Dutch one, and a little less concerned about theology. So there's some differences there as well. Now, the Puritans in England and the Dutch further Reformation, so we're settling on this term now, had a lot in common. A lot in common. They both held each other in high esteem and there was an English-Scottish community of Puritan persuasion that took refuge in the Netherlands and established tens of thousands of members in 350 English-speaking churches in the Netherlands at the, in, during this time period. Some of them were established to get away from a Bloody Mary, but also later on in the 17th century, even more were established when the Puritans were persecuted under some of the other uh, English monarchical rulers. Now, the Dutch government allowed the English and also some of the Scottish, it was mostly English, Puritans, but some of the Scottish, they allowed them to organize churches and even form an English classis within the Dutch Reformed Church. So imagine that. You've got a Dutch Reformed denomination It's got its classes and senates. You might say assemblies or something else. In the Dutch world, we say classes. And then the final body of authority is the senate. They actually had an English classes that had representatives ultimately at the Dutch senate. And so they had to send representatives who also knew Dutch, but their services were in English at church. And so... The Dutch had some impact on the English, and the English certainly had even more impact on the Dutch. And uh, many Dutch reform ministers were very impressed by the practical divinity of the English Puritans. Now, the way it all began in the Netherlands was through a man named William Tillich. Sometimes... uh, people mention in in history books, a man named Jean Taffin, who was a whole generation earlier. Uh, He would sort of be like William Tyndale and John Knox to the English Puritans, as we heard in in a talk yesterday, kind of a precursor. Some people call him the first Nadara Reformatsi writer, but it's iffy. Uh, He was really a reformer, but there were seeds of thought 
in Jean Tiffin that preempted the Dutch Further Reformation. But the real father of the movement, the real William Perkins guy who established English Puritanism in the Dutch movement is Willem Tielink, or Tielink as the Dutch would say. That's W-I-L-L-E-M, which is William in Dutch, and Tielink would be T double E double L I N C K. And what happens to Willem Tailink is that um, he's kind of a nominal member of the Dutch church. Maybe he is saved, but he's not very zealous for the Lord. And he goes to Banbury, England. And a family takes him in, a very God fearing Puritan family. And they do family worship, 20, 30 minutes a day. And they talk every day about the things of God, about their spiritual experiences. And Taylink is blown away. He's never seen anything like this, heard of anything like this. He is profoundly impacted. If he wasn't saved before, he's surely saved now. And if he was saved before, he's, it's almost like a second conversion to him. And he's just overwhelmed with the godliness of this family. And then he discovers that there are thousands of Puritans all throughout England who worship God this way and family worship every day. And he is very, very impressed. Now, what doesn't hurt is that he fell in love with the daughter of that family. (laughs) And so they decide to marry and return to the Netherlands. And they make an agreement together, even before they're married, that they will go back to the Netherlands and he will try to stir up in the Netherlands this same English Puritan movement. He goes back to the Netherlands and he begins this movement. And he gets criticized on all sides. The Arminians think he's too Calvinistic. The Calvinists think he's too active and almost seems like as if man can do something. So they kind of called him an Arminian. Uh, But but his movement of practical Christian godliness and applying the Reformation truths to every area of life begins to take off. He writes 129 books, 129 books, and dies at the age of 44. He's very active. Uh, There are other ministers that begin to imbibe his principles. And 69 of his books get published and the other 60 disappear. We only have references to many of them. We don't even know the full titles of some of them. But 69 were published in the Netherlands. So he's the one that really brings English Puritanism across the channel and plants it in the Netherlands. As time goes on, you see, there are other influences that also impact the Dutch Further Reformation movement. If it were not for those influences, yeah, we would just call it Dutch Puritanism, because that's the way it it began, through the English Puritan uh, movement. Now, what is the essence of the Dutch for the Reformation? This is my, uh, my second point. <coughs> so, after the Reformation in the Netherlands, strenuous efforts were made to replace the Roman Catholic Church with the Reformed Church as a, an inclusive church of all of society. That was not uncommon in Europe at that time. For example, if you were in a certain part of Germany and the elector of that palatinate that you were in would, or that territory you were in would say, I'm a Lutheran, that would mean everyone in that whole realm would, would have to be Lutheran. And so if you were Reformed, you'd, you'd say, oh, dear family, <laughs> I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to move to a new area. And you would move to another area of Germany that was... Where the, where the leader embraced the Reformed faith. So in the Netherlands, it wasn't all that uncommon that they would ask the people 
can we have a state church? And under a state church, all the ministers would get paid by the government, and that would be the preferred church. They get some support for the government, for their buildings, and so on. So the Netherlands was so dominated by the Reformed churches that they made the state church to be Reformed, which meant that a lot of Lutherans moved out of the area and so on. But they didn't really exclude everyone totally. So a few Roman Catholics stayed, a few Lutherans stayed, but, but they were in the minority. A few Anabaptists stayed. But generally speaking, uh, the Dutch church became the church of the state church, the Dutch Reformed Church, I should say. Now, what did that mean? Well, it meant by the end of the 17th century that 60% of the citizens of the nation of the Netherlands were members of the Dutch Reformed State Church. 60%. I mean, that's huge. Before it was declared a state church, the number was less than 10%. Now, Abraham Kuyper, who is a late 19th century, early 20th century, <coughs> phenomenal, huge figure in the, the Dutch churches and in politics, even became prime minister for a while. He viewed this as a very sad development, looking back a couple hundred years. Because what happened was you got all kinds of nominal members into the church. And it became socially not only acceptable, but socially desirable. If you, had, if you were a businessman, you'd probably join the state church because it was good to be able to say to people who came to your business, uh, oh, by the way, I'm a member of the state church. So, Kuiper argues that the godliness in the churches went way down through the state church. And even though the numbers went way up. And then what happened was, sometimes it's, this is called by church historians, second generation phenomena. And what does that mean? Well, the first generation establishes a movement. They're full of zeal. They do it in a principled way, Right? The children grow up, the second generation, and they take it all for granted, and they grow lukewarm. That's just a general pattern in church history. So much so that scholars call it the second generation phenomenon. Now, sometimes at the end of that second generation, or at the beginning of the third generation, some people get connected either through their grandfathers or whatever, or through their writings, back with the first generation and say, wow, we've, we've gone a long ways downhill here. Where is the former zeal? Where is the, the former love for God and for Christ? And, and there's a stirring up among the godly for the olden days where there was more spiritual vitality. So that's what happened to Willem Tielink. And that's what happened with people that began to follow Willem T. Lincoln, began to catch on that this movement of the first Reformation among the Dutch back in the 1540s, 1550s, we're, we're, we're far from that now. And the church has, has too many liberal tendencies. Um, in the original Reformation, some of the Reformers said, a threefold cord will not easily be broken. And uh, they believe that Israel would, or, or Netherlands would become the new Israel of the West. And uh, there were followers and church members who would get together and they would have what's called in Dutch, it's a hard word to translate, chazelschapen. And chazelschapen were, the best way I can describe it, is gatherings of the people of God in each other's homes to share the experiences, the spiritual experiences God has brought them through and to, to uh, pastor each other and edify each other and shepherd each other in, in, the way, in the narrow way to everlasting life. Well, those movements, you see, they began to disintegrate and people also clamored to have those back. And so from these different seeds, 
um, a development arose that basically emphasized the need for sanctification, the need for piety and godliness, that zeal must be pursued, that reformation doctrine must be lived. And that is what became the Nadere Reformatie or the Dutch Further Reformation. So by 1983, 1983, there developed, well, actually earlier than that, there developed also from the mid 20th century on, actually, a group called the uh, the Dutch Further Reformation Society, not a Reformatie Society, in the Netherlands. It wasn't a big group, but it's a group of scholars that still it's ongoing today, and they have a periodical called the Documentati Blot, not a Reformatie. That is the 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 the, the Dutch magazine of the of the Dutch Further Reformation. And it comes out uh, two times a year, about 100 pages, and it's always fresh studies written by those ministers and scholars in the Netherlands today that still want to revive the Dutch Further Reformation. Much like, say, I and some other people in America are trying to promote reading the Puritan writers uh, so that we might have more godly vit vit living of vitality in real life. So they're trying to do that with the Dutch writers. So in 1983, this group, after much study and many meetings, wrote up a definition of the Dutch Further Reformation. What is the essence of it? And this is what they wrote. This movement within the Nederdijks Gereformeerde Kerk that is, the, the Dutch Reformed Church, while opposing prevailing abuses and misconceptions and pursuing the broadening and progressive advancement of the 16th century Reformation, urges and strives with prophetic zeal for both the inner experience of Reformed doctrine and personal sanctification, as well as the radical and total sanctification of all spheres of life. So, that sounds exactly like a definition of English Puritanism, doesn't it? In at least most of its aspects. So they want to go back to the First Reformation. They want to be zealous. They want to stress the need to experience from within the beauties and the truths of the Reformed doctrine, and to grow in personal sanctification. But they also want to have that spill over beyond the internal man and impact all of society. Now, what happens in the Dutch for the Reformation is the first couple generations, that's their goal. The second couple of generations, so generations three and four of the Nader Reformatie, they give up on trying to sanctify society. It was just hopeless. They weren't making much progress. And so they became a little bit more introspective, more searching of themselves. And they met in smaller groups, and the movement died out with the last Nadere Reformatsi writer being uh, Vandergrew, who died in 1784. So Puritanism actually ended in the early 18th century, Dutch Nadere Reformatsi went to the late 18th century. So it started later and it ended later. Now, the preaching of the Further Reformation ministers emphasized what the Puritans called experiential or experimental theology. And what they were teaching was that external religion Outward orthodox doctrine, sound theological propositions are all insufficient for salvation. You need to experience the truths of God. You need to experience the grace of the gospel. You need to experience spiritual warfare and genuine prayer and so on. In other words, head knowledge is not sufficient for eternity. It must become a matter also of the heart. So that really is the essence 
of the Dutch for the Reformation. You can see how similar it is now to English Puritanism. Now, what books are available today? This is my third thought. And uh, who are these men that wrote these books that are now available today in, in English? Well, first of all, I mentioned to you already about the pioneering influence of, of Willem Tielink. Um, I had the privilege of editing this volume of Tielink, which is the only one available till today. It's called The Path of True Godliness by Willem Tielink. It's um, 300 pages long, and it's an amazing book on sanctification, living holily before God. And in my opinion, it's the best book I've ever read in my life about holiness. Uh, it, it's just a fantastic book. And it, it comes from both the antithetical perspective, living anti this world, but also living pro-Jesus and what it means to grow in likeness to Christ. So T-Link... Um, wrote a lot about sanctification. He also wrote quite a bit on the Lord's Supper, which still has not been translated, and on keeping Sabbath. He was a big believer. He was very impressed by the Puritans in England, how they kept a strict Sabbath where the whole day would be dedicated to God. And Teeling brought that over into the Netherlands. So it's not just enough to go to church once or twice on Sunday, but you dedicate the whole day to God as a forerunner to the eternal Sabbath to come in glory. So you call the whole day a Sabbath of delight, Isaiah 58, verse 13. Now, the prince of the movement was a man named Hesbertus Vucius. Vucius, V-O-E-T-I-U-S. Vucius was, to the Dutch Further Reformation, what John Owen was to English Puritanism. And uh, Vuches wedded together a Reformed scholastic methodology with heartfelt piety. He studied theology at the University of Leiden, became an ardent defender of Reformed orthodoxy against Arminianism. By the time the Synod of Dort met in 1618, he was one of the representatives there he became a professor of theology and Semitic languages, Hebrew, Arabic, and Syriac, at the University of Utrecht, where he labored for 42 years. And for most of that time, he also continued to preach in various churches every week and to engage even in pastoral visitation. Interestingly, the renowned academic John Owen of the Netherlands, Heisbertus Vucius, who was really brilliant in his theology. Once a week, he catechized the orphan children of Utrecht. He was a humble man. By the time of his death, he had influenced a large number of ministers who served throughout the Netherlands and who had been his uh, theological students. In fact, there was a name for them. It was called the Vuchen, V-O-E-T-I-A-N, circle. The Vuchen circle. And Vuchen's model of theological training was academic, academics combined with heartfelt piety. He said, we have to bring both to our students at a high level of teaching but we also have to stress with our students that they, may, they must have spiritual formation by the work of the Holy Spirit within them. This, in turn, became a motto that several of the Puritan-type movements embraced in Scotland, in Germany, in New England, in England, in the Netherlands. And so it became a common, common label for schools that promoted Puritan-type teaching and preaching that seminaries should combine scholarship and piety. And we, for example, Puritan Reform Seminary in Grand Rapids, today, in our literature, we make mention of what I'm mentioning to you right now. 
that we stand in that stream. We want our students to be godly men, not just well-trained in exegeting Scripture, but in exegeting in such a way that they also apply it to everyday life of, of the people. So that's uh, a little bit about, about Vucis. Now, Vucis wrote a number of books that still have not been translated from Latin even into Dutch because he was a very a prolific writer. He's got uh, five volumes, huge volumes of thousands of pages on, on church government that um, some Dutch scholars are thinking about raising money for now to translate into Dutch. And some of us are thinking about doing it over here in English, but, you know, it hasn't developed yet. But there's one popular book he wrote with another not a Matsi divine called Spiritual Desertion. It counsels people who feel deserted by God, either through some great affliction or just can't feel closeness to God. It's a great book. We translated that book into English about 10 years ago. Spiritual Desertion by Vucis and Hornbeek was the man's name, H. O-O-R-N-B-E-E-K. That book has sold quite well, not as well as The Path of True Godliness. We did, I've, actually, I've actually done eight books in this series. They all have a similar cover, and the T-Link book has sold by far the best. But Spiritual Diversion is probably second on the list. Petrus van Maastricht, interesting individual, um, Petrus van Maastricht was a Dutch Reformed theologian who studied at Utrecht under Vucis and Hornbeek. So he was belonging to the Vucin circle. He pastored several churches in the Netherlands and then taught at the universities of Duisburg and Utrecht. And he wrote out a massive seven-volume systematic theology. It was translated into Dutch uh, from Latin, maybe 20 years later, and then it was translated into English, or is being translated into English, from about 2016, and we hope to finish it about 2025. I've been very intimately involved in this. I belong, as I'm vice president of Dutch Reformed Translation Society, and I uh, promoted it in the society and worked on the whole committee, it comes from about seven different denominations, until the committee was persuaded that we should do this work. So we have a man translating it from Latin. We have another Latin translator who looks over that translation, makes changes, goes back to the first man, then goes back to the second man. Then it comes to me, and I'm the editor of it in English. And right now, I just finished volume four. Volumes one, two, and three are published. Um, I saw there's just a couple copies left. I think they all went on the table here. But uh, you can order it from heritagebooks.org, volumes 1, 2, and 3. And when I go back home next week, I will be typing in all my handwritten corrections on volume 4, which I did on a whole bunch of airplanes. And uh, we'll be going to, to press with volume 4. Meanwhile, the translators are about halfway through volume 5, and we're hoping, hoping to finish... Volume 7 by 2025, and probably by the time it, the last volume is published, it will be 2026. Now, <clears throat> the Maastricht's work is a very high level. It's actually above Bavink. Uh, Jonathan Edwards called it the best book ever written by any human being other than the Bible. I mentioned that already in another address. It's called Theoretical Dash Practical theology, theoretical-practical theology. The strength of this work is that the Maastricht uses a similar approach throughout. First, he expounds a particular passage on the doctrine. Then he gives a systematic theology of the doctrine it teaches. Then he answers any objections raised against that doctrine. And then he has a closing section of practical experiential, and practical applications. Now, that was the old way of doing systematics. And Ben Maastricht does it at a very high level. I mean, his, every sentence is packed full of meaning. He's not for the average layperson. 
He's more, he's more academic. So in my, it's more for doctoral students and THM students. In my, dis, in my systematic theology, for example, which I've just completed um, the fourth and the last volume, and that's off to Crossway now, and first three volumes are here, I believe, or first two, maybe the third one sold out, I think. But I follow the old style, but I also address the contemporary issues. But my goal is to be true to the Dutch and the English Puritans in first telling you what the Bible says, then telling you what church history says, then telling you how you experience this doctrine, then what are the major practical takeaways. Only we add a section at the end with a poem or a hymn at the end of every doctrine so that you end in doxological praise to God for that particular doctrine. And our, my, my systematic theology aims at the beginning seminary level, so it's a much wider target audience. And my goal is to take the best of the Dutch tradition and the best of the English tradition, combine them, and then give my own thoughts on it as well so that you get the best of the old and best of the new. And probably those who are slightly above the average level of reading of the average church member, um, although my systematics is being used in 11th grade classrooms, uh, but it's really written for beginning seminary students. And it's being translated now into Portuguese, into Chinese, into Korean, into Spanish, and hopefully other languages down the road. And we're hoping it will be used in seminaries all, all around the world. So I'm really sitting on the shoulders of in Maastricht and Brockle, who I'll tell you about in a minute, and I'm right in between them. Brockle being very simple, for the lay people only, really. Van Maastricht being very scholarly, and I'm trying to bridge the gap in between and say, I want to write something for people that are very interested in theology, maybe, but they're just graduated from high school, and they could read it. And certainly office bearers could read it, and ministers could read it, and uh, academics could read it and profit from it, even though it's not as scholarly as, as Van Maastricht. So you can see in my own life how I'm influenced by the Maastricht. I'm influenced by Brockle, as well as by, of course, about 25 systematic theologies that have been written in church history in the English language as well. Now, Wilhelmsar Brockle is the set I, I said I would take on a desert island if I could only have one set of books because he goes through systematic theology and ethics is attached at the end which is the old-fashioned way of doing it in the Netherlands. And by the way, I follow that style in volume three of my writing. Just don't do only salvation, but also do the ethics that flow out of salvation. Because if you separate ethics from systematic theology, almost always ethics goes liberal. So, Brockle, volumes one and two are really his systematic theology. Volumes three and four are really his ethics. And I, I spent six years working on that set uh, as editor, and Bart Elsot was a translator. And um, that set has sold more than 30,000 sets, so 120,000 volumes, and has got a tremendous response from, from lay people as well as ministers, because it's such a help to ministers, because at the end of each doctrine, it gives you the same thing the Maastricht does and the same thing I do, it gives you practical applications. But Brockle's practical applications are outstanding, and they're very, very helpful. He's a real pastor. Now, Brockle became so popular in Dutch circles that his books became as popular as John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress in English. If you were a typical farmer of the state church in the Netherlands, the state Reformed church, and you came in from the fields... And after you had supper, you would do family worship, of course. You'd read the Bible, you'd sing a psalm, you'd pray, and then you'd say, children, let us now lazen in stukje van vader brakel. Let us now read a piece of father brakel. He wasn't Roman Catholic, but they called him father out of fondness. And so the father would then read a piece of father, of father brakel, and they would discuss it a bit, and then 
they'd read all four volumes and they'd start over and read the all four volumes again. Uh, that's the kind of work this was in the Netherlands. It was so very, very well received. Let me just read to you a couple chapter titles from chapters 45 on, which are the ethical chapters. Systematic chapters are, are basically systematic theology. But here's what Brockle includes under ethics. Exposition of the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, how to live by faith out of God's promises, chapter, how to exercise love toward God and His Son, two chapters, how to fear, obey, and hope in God, each one of those is a chapter, how to profess Christ and His truth, a chapter, how to exercise a host of spiritual graces such as courage, contentment, self-denial, a chapter on all of these, patience, uprightness, watchfulness, neighborly love, humility, meekness, peaceableness, diligence, compassion, and prudence. So about 12 chapters there. And other topics, fasting, solitude, spiritual meditation, singing, vows, spiritual experience, spiritual growth, backsliding, spiritual desertion, temptations, indwelling corruption, spiritual darkness and deadness, a chapter on all those things. I just read to you from chapter 45 to chapter 98. 40, uh, that's 54 chapters on all these subjects. It's, it's really beautiful. So in English, we call it the Christian's reasonable service, taken from what I read to you from Romans 12, verse 1, where Paul says, give your whole life to the Lord, your bodies. But, but the Greek there means your entire being, your body, your soul, your mind. Give it all to the Lord, which is only your reasonable service. So Brockle is saying, this is your reasonable service to be well-grounded in all the truths of the Bible and then to live them out in ethics. Herman Witsius, Herman Witsius, like the Maastricht and Brockle, studied theology under Vucius, uh, but it was uh, through a local pastor, Eustis van der Bolhart, that Vucius came experientially to faith. And he wrote that he was born again in the bosom of the Utrecht church by the living word of this godly minister. Uh, Vucius labored uh, in the ministry for a while and then went to serve three seminaries, Franeker for five years, Utrecht for 19 years, and Leiden for the last 10 years of his life. Vucius wrote a trilogy of books that he's known for. Um, the first and the most famous is The Economy of the Covenant. So we've got six or seven sets left of this. This is a systematic theology arranged according to the covenant. Not every single doctrine is taken up in these two, two volumes, but 90% of them are. But they're through the lens of the covenant. So if you're interested in covenant theology, you definitely want Vucius. This is a classic. Uh, we've reprinted this three times, and uh, it's, it's a great work, a standard work by um, Herman Vitzius. And then he also wrote Sacred Dissertations on the Apostles' Creed. That's a two-volume. We, we have also have that in print right now. And one volume on the Lord's Prayer. All five volumes two on the Covenants, two on the Apostles' Creed, one on the Lord's Prayer, all five volumes are outstanding, and they're all available. Theodor Vreelingheisen, uh, Ke Kevin DeYoung, you heard his story <laughs> about Vreelingheisen. Vreelingheisen was a bit of a character, but he was very godly still and uh, had a profound impact in converting many people and was called the great forerunner of the Great Awakening. So I... I brought all of Friedenheisen's sermons into English. Uh, I think it's 28 of them. About 20 years ago, I did that. Erdman's published the book, and I, I wrote together with another minister a 30-page preface to his life and ministry. There's still a few copies available, I think 50 copies, and they'll be out of print. It's called Forerunner, Theodore Friedenheisen, Forerunner of the Great Awakening. And then the last two writers, Alexander Cymru, Alexander Cymru. Cymru was born in Scotland. He was catechized by Ebenezer and Ralph Erskine. And as a young adult, 
he moved to the Netherlands where he worked for a Rotterdam merchant. And God called him from there to the ministry. He served a single church for 38 years for the rest of his life, Waubrugge. And uh, a little book by Cymru was translated by some strict Baptists in England in 1978. And then uh, it's called the ABC of Faith. It gives you about 26 descriptions from the Bible about the doctrine of faith. And his great classic, however, has been untranslated until about one year ago. And Bart Elsout also translated that one. It's called uh, Handling the Attributes of God. And then I edited it. And right now it is being um, printed by Reformation Heritage Books. should be out in about eight months from now. And that's a wonderful book as well, about 450 pages talking about all the various attributes of God. Last one is Theodorus Vandergrew. He's the last Nadere Reformatie divine. He, um, his most famous work was the two-volume work of the exposition of the Heidelberg Catechism. He looks at every phrase, every phrase of the Catechism. And explains it in sermons, like a hundred and, uh, uh, wait a minute, no, not a hundred, 60 to 70 sermons. And uh, it's two volumes, it's about 900 pages, and again, Bart Elsow translated that, 2018-19, and I edited it. And that has been in print for about one year. And if you're interested in Hubbard Catechism at all, it's, it's a masterful work um, to, to look at. Now, there's been two or three other works that have been done. Uh, Johannes van der Kemp's catechism has been done about 100 years ago. And Abraham Hellenbrook, his famous question book, has been done. I grew up under that. And then there's four or five other little books in this series that um, we have printed. Um, here's one right here, William Schortenheis, Essential Truths in the Heart of a Christian. Here's another one, Jadokas van Lodenstein, A Spiritual Appeal to Christ's Bride, written on the uh, book of the Song of Solomon. And then there's one also by Wilhelm Sabrockel that we did in remembrance of him, in remembrance of him profiting from the Lord's Supper. So the last 15 years of my life, I've been active in bringing these Dutch Reformed writers uh, into English. I hope you'll profit from them. I hope you'll pick at least one of them up and you'll see right away the spiritual substance of their, of their writings. So in conclusion, the influence of the Further Reformation's devotional writings and sermons and academic works from the 18th century until today remains quite substantial, particularly in Dutch, but also is now beginning to grow in English, uh, in the Netherlands, in South Africa, but happily also in North America. And we have plans in the future to do many more Dutch Further Reformation writers. So I hope that names like Vuches and Schortenhuis and Van der Groo and Cymru will soon be household names in all American evangelical Reformed and Puritan families. God bless you. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank thee so much for thy mercies showered upon us in these moments, and we thank thee for the Dutch Puritans and their impact. Even though, Lord, they failed to change the Netherlands and its social structures, we do thank thee that they impacted so many tens of thousands of lives for godly spirituality. Please continue to bless their writings until today, and bless us as we study and read and profit from them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.